Roman aqueducts, marbles of engineer, feats of architectural genius, and even war machines? Stay with me until the end and you'll uncover the mind-blowing ways aqueducts power not just seas, but Roman military might. Along the way, we'll reveal secrets of power, luxury, and hiding uses that will change the way you see these ancient structures. In this episode, you'll uncover the secrets behind these engineer wonders that most people never talk about it. How they shape Rome's politics, how they symbolize imperial power, and the extraordinary ways they were used beyond just water supply. Aqueducts were mainly from drinking water. Many people assume aqueducts were built to supply the city's drinking water. Only a small percentage was for this purpose. Most of the water was used for public baths, ornamental fountains, irrigation of gardens, and even to fill private fish ponds. Wealthy Romans enjoyed personal water supplies, and one of the most luxurious uses was for Emperor Nero to reroute water to his Domus Aurea, complete with elaborate fountains and pools. They were necessary everywhere. In some places, like Tuscany, water wasn't scarce. Aqueducts there were more about displaying Roman's power and urban sophistication than meeting an essential need. The Aqua Traiana, built by Emperor Trajan in 109 AD, primarily supplied water to the luxury villas in the countryside outside Rome. They were flawless from the start. People often think aqueducts were perfectly from day one. Early attempts were full of challenges. The Aqua Appia, Rome's first aqueduct, built in 312 BC, was largely underground to protect it from potential Sabine or Volscian attacks, but its height and construction also made it difficult to maintain. Censor Appius Claudius Caesus initiated its construction during the time of the Second Samnite War, when Rome was expanding and the growing population needed more relatable water supplies. Rome wasn't the first civilization to build water system. Before the Romans, there were the Etruscan and the Greeks, who provided the foundation for Roman hydraulic engineering. The Etruscans inhabited central Italy before the rise of Rome, had a profound influence on early Roman engineers. They built drainage systems such as the Cloaca Maxima, one of the world's earliest sewage systems. This design inspired the Romans to build not only for utility but for grandeur. They learned to channel and control water to drain marshes, irrigate fields, and later built aqueducts. During the Punic Wars, when Rome became more connected with Greek colonies, they observed Greek aqueducts in places like Syracuse. The Greeks' use of siphons and underground pipes fascinated the Romans. As Roman grew, the city's leader consoled Greek engineers to better understand how to bring fresh water into the burgeoning city. When Censor Apius Claudius Caius built the first aqueduct, the Aqua Appia, it was based on a blend of local and grain expertise. By the time of Emperor Augustus, aqueducts were seen not only as utilities but as symbols of Roman might. Augustus himself commissioned the construction of the Aqua Virgo in the 19th BC to celebrate his military victories. This aqueduct still fits water to Rome's Trevi Fountain, a symbol of Roman grandeur to this day. At the height of the Roman Empire, the total length of aqueducts bill was approximately 1500 miles, 800 kilometers. To understand how aqueducts work, Let's break it down from the ground out. They weren't just the stone arches carrying water across valleys. Behind the arches lay a complex system built to last. Most Roman aqueducts began their journey at natural springs, often high in the mountains where water was plentiful and clean. For example, the Aqua Virgo started near to Anio River, about 19 kilometers east of Rome, and tapped into several springs. These frequent but fascinated aqueducts like Aqua Alciatina drew water for Lake Alciatinus, but this aqueduct wasn't built for drinking. It was used for irrigation and, surprisingly, to flow the Nomachia for mock naval battles. The Romans used local materials like limestone and volcanic stuff, which were abundant in Italy. Their cement, called Opus Canticium, was a to mother concrete. 
It was a strong and cool set underwater, which was critical for aqueducts like the Aqua Claudia, which traversed challenging terrain. To ensure the water purity, aqueduct channels were often lined with lead of terracotta pipes, but the dangers of lead were unknown at the time. To ensure the water's purity, aqueduct channels were often lined with lead or terracotta pipes, through the dangers of lead were unknown at the time. Roman engineers lead of gravity to move water. The aqueducts were built with a slight but consistent slope, about one meter of drop for every 300 meters in length. Roman surveyors used instruments like curvates to measure precise gradients. Siphons were used when valleys need to be crossed without building tall arches. These pipes, made from lead, would carry water down one side of a valley and force it up to the other, overcoming natural obstacles. From the source, water entered, specules or channels were, were lined with waterproof mortar. These channels ran through underground tunnels and across valleys on elevated arches. Along the way, the water passed through Pinalinaria to remove debris and sediment. An example of this was seen in the Aqua Claudia, which carried water for over 69 kilometers, facing through multiple valleys and crossing over the Anunovus Aqueduct on a short superstructure. Once inside the city, the water was distributed through Casella, which were water towers and reservoirs built along the aqueducts. From here, water flowed through underground pipes to various destinations. Public fountains, public baths, private homes, and commercial enterprise. Maintenance workers, known as Aquari, monitored the system. They ensured the channel stay clear of blockage and repair any damage, typically maintaining the system every few months or as needed. During the raining season, Roman engineers monitored the water's levels carefully. If there was too much water, they had diversion channels built into the system to redirect excess flow, protecting the aqueducts from overloading. During droughts, water was rationed to ensure that vital services like public baths and fountains remain operational. Depending on the land and complexity, aqueducts took years to build. The Aqua Marcha, one of the longest aqueducts, 81 kilometers, took nearly a decade to complete, spanning 144-140 BC under the orders of Pretor Quintus Marcius Rex. A large workforce of slaves, soldiers, and skilled artisans was used. In more complex projects, military engineers supervised the construction, ensuring the empire's logistical demands were met. A special office was created, Curator Aquarum, established under Emperor Augustus and given to high-ranking officials like Marcus Agrippa, who was responsible for overseeing the entire water supply network. From the first aqueduct, the Aqua Appia, to the towering Aqua Claudia, Roman engineers constantly refined their techniques. While many pictured aqueducts as towering arches, did you know that some of the Rome's first aqueducts were hiding underground? This concealed infrastructure not only keep the water supply safe from enemies, but create a vast labyrinth beneath the empire. Aqua Appia The first aqueduct was built almost entirely underground. It was practical but rudimentary, using simple stone line channels to protect it from enemies and weathering. Aqua Aniovetus this aqueduct was built only in the first Punic when Rome's population was growing rapidly. Unlike the Appia, much of it was elevated on arches, marking the transition to the iconic Roman design. Aqua Claudia, one of the largest. The Claudia stands as a symbol of Rome's engineer maturity. Spanning 69 kilometers, it brought water from the Anu River and required massive, multi tiered arches to cross valleys. Compare the design with the Aqua Traiana, which used more advanced filtration system to remove impurities before the water reach the sea. Some of the most iconic aqueducts built by the Romans still stand today, not just a relic of the past but as a functioning pieces of infrastructure. Aqua Virgo and the Trevi Fountain the Aqua Virgo built in 19 BC under Augustus still fits Rome's most famous fountain, the Trevi Fountain. This fountain is not only a tourist magnet but also a marble of hydraulic engineer that has worked for over 2,000 years. Legends say that the aqueduct was named after a young virgin who pointed Roman soldiers to the stream from which the water rose, hence the name Aqua Virgo. The Fountain of the Four Rivers in Piazza Navona, designed by Bernini, taps into the Aqua Virgo as well. 
It was commissioned by Pope Innocent in 1651 and represents the four great rivers of the world, the Nile, Ganges, the Nude, and Rio de la Plata. Another fascinating fountain, Fontana de la Paula, constructed in 1612, taps into the Aqua Traiana. It was proposed by projects, reviving one of the lesser known aqueducts to supply water to the Vatican City and its surrounding districts. Aqua Claudia is another stunning structure, with parts of arches and still visible in the Parco degli Aquedotti. It once fed many of the greatest public baths in Rome, including the Baths of Titus and the Baths of Caracalla. This aqueducts not only serve everyday needs but also supply imperial plots and gardens. Nero expand the cloudy supply to his Domus Aurea, an extravagant palace with sprawling gardens and artificial lakes. Water wasn't just a necessity in ancient Rome, it was divine. Romans believed the gods placed the water and many myths surrounded these miraculous sources. Water was seen as a gift from Neptune, the god of the sea. Neptune wasn't just associated with the oceans but also with rivers and fresh water. Temples dedicated to Neptune often featured fountains and water elements that symbolize his power. Similarly, Pontus, the god of wells and spring, was believed to bless fresh water. And many Romans believed that drinking from a specific springs would grant divine favor. Romans believed that certain springs, like those at Aquae Sulis, were blessed by the gods and could heal elements. This spring of Aqua Alcetina, thought not used from drinking, were believed to have some divine significance to their clear, pure water. Rituals will be performed at fountains and springs to thank the gods for their blessing or ask for favors. Many fountains were considered sacred spaces where people would make offerings to ensure the continued flow of water. When aqueducts fell or when water was scarce, Romans believed that they had angered the gods. Agur's Roman priests, who interpret the will of the gods, were often consulted during droughts to see if a divine favorite need to be restored to fix water problems. Aqueducts didn't just bring water, they deliver loyalty. Roman emperors like August or Trajan used water infrastructures to ensure the people had public baths and fountains, reinforcing the rule through practical benefits. This aqueduct for a vast and intricate network that spanned the entire Roman Empire, designed with an impressive level of foresight and precision to meet the needs of growing urban centers. Aqueducts were not just functional, they were essential for the expansion and sustainability of city across the empire, like a modern metro system connecting stations. The aqueducts supply water to key locations as, such as public fountains, baths, and latrines, ensuring that the water was available for the population at regular intervals. Average fountains were placed every few kilometers in densely populated areas, giving residents consistent access to fresh water. This fountain served not just as water points but also as social hubs where citizens gathered. Public baths or thermae were another critical element in Roman urban planning, and their placement was often directly tied to the aqueduct system. Larger cities could host several major bathhouses, strategically located to distribute the flow of water efficiently. For instance, in Rome, the baths of Caracalla and the baths of Diocletian were both fed by different aqueducts, ensuring a continuous, abundant supply of water for the bath pools, saunas, and fountains. Aqueducts support public infrastructure that became the center of daily Roman life. Aqueducts were located at critical nodes where they will serve the greatest number of people. This strategic placement was essential in creating an efficient urban environment. Take the Aqua Marcia, one of the longest aqueducts in Rome, spanning 91 kilometers. Its precise construction allowed it to deliver fresh cold water to the city from distant mountain springs. Romans were so accurate in measuring gradients that their techniques are still studied and used by engineers today. For example, they employ inclinometers to maintain a steady, gentle decline over long distances, ensuring water will flow continuously without losing momentum or becoming stagnant. Each aqueduct formed part of a larger interconnect system of infrastructure that resemble the complexity of today's city-wide utilities. Larger cities such as Rome, Constantinople, and Carthage were often served by multiple aqueducts, allowing for redundancy and ensuring water flow in case 
Phase 1 system need maintenance or repairs. In this way, Rome's water network was like a layer transportation grid with various lines crisscrossing the city and beyond to serve residential, commercial and industrial areas. They used tools like the Groma and Corvates for surveying and ensuring perfect alignment. Even with rudimentary tools, Roman engineers could achieve feats of precision that still bubble more experts. Romans invent lead peeping fistulae to distribute water which, despite its health risks, was a revolutionary technology. This concept of distributing water through pressurized pipes directly influenced the way modern cities handle conflict today. The invert siphon system, used in places like Lyon, France, was an early precursor to modern hydraulic engineering, enabling water to cross deep valleys without massive structures. Also, did you know that Roman aqueducts weren't just for water supply? They were ancient engineers for industry. In southern Gaul, water mills powered by aqueducts helped fit entire legions, proving the Romans were as innovative in war logistics as they were in battle. The Romans were shy about showing off their aqueducts in creative ways, from mock naval battles to palace luxuries, but one of the most surprising uses was during times of war. You might think aqueducts were only about supplying water to cities, but they also served a surprising role in Roman warfare. During sieges, Roman engineers would rewrote or even cut off the water supply to enemy cities, turning aqueducts into strategic tools of war. By controlling the water source, the Romans could weaken their enemies, forcing them to surrender to two-thirds contamination or floating. In some cases, aqueducts were even used to flow enemies' defenses, or to breach city walls by overwhelming them with redirect water. This strategic use of aqueducts shows that they weren't just marvels of urban engineers, but also deadly weapons in Rome's military arsenal. One of the most extravagant uses of aqueducts was the floating of Naumachiae arenas where Romans would stage mock naval battles. The most famous example is Emperor Augustus Naumachia, a massive basin near to the Tiber, filled with water from the Aqua Asiatina, which was not suitable for drinking but perfect for these spectacular shows. Early air conditioning Emperor Nero diverted water from the Aqua Claudia to supply his Domus Aurea, an opulent palace complete with artificial lakes, gardens, and waterfalls. He even designed his palace to have running water flowing through the walls to keep rooms cool, an early version of air conditioning. The Roman baths of Caracalla were so large that they could hold up 1,600 people at once. These baths were supplied by the Aqua Marcia and the Aqua Antoniana, with water flowing constantly to build the bath pools, heat the water, and operate on the floor heating system. Roman aqueducts are more than just ancient relics. They are a testament to human innovation, blending practicality with art and turning water into a source of light and power. Thanks for joining me today and don't forget to subscribe for more videos like this.